Do you have an emergency? I, I don't know if it qualifies for emergency or not. To me, it is. It's the phone call no parent ever wants to have to make. A desperate 911 about a missing child. I have a 16-year-old daughter who has not been home, hasn't went to work, can't get a hold of her from any of her friends. I am scared to death. And what's her name? Skylar Niece. What were you feeling at that point for your little girl? I was scared to death. I mean, I, was, I didn't know where my baby was. I mean, it's just, how would you feel? It was horrible. Nothing would ever be the same for Dave Neese and his wife, Mary, after that call in July 2012. That was one of my favorites. That was number one, had to be. Or for the small suburban community of Star City, West Virginia, who would grapple with the mystery of Skylar Neese's disappearance. Star City is a small little city off of Morgantown. It is a great place to live. It is a wonderful place to raise your family. As much as we have this real small knit community, we also have a university. Morgantown was more college town. Your crime was more college, property crimes, college kids having parties, typical stuff that any other college town would have, but nothing really serious. It has that college town shine and bounce. It's not a podunk town and it's not an urban metropolis. It's a combo and yeah. it's breathtakingly beautiful there. A blue collar middle class town with working families like Dave and Mary Niece. He worked at Walmart and she had a doctor's office. And that's the norm for this area. Morgantown's a fairly decent community. It's peaceful. It's a small town that's growing really fast. It's the kind of area where outside of college football, not much happens. So when 16-year-old Skylar Niece went missing on a summer evening in July, people were stunned. Now, more than a decade after her disappearance, a new podcast has topped the charts, exploring Skylar's story, which is still reverberating. My name is Holly Moulet. My name is Justine Harmon, and we are the co-hosts and co-creators of Three. Three. The story felt like a gothic reimagining of everyone's teenage experience. When you peel apart who these people were and what the circumstances were, they're fairly universal and human and relatable, and those are the things that interest me. This is episode one, Skylar is Missing. Part of the intrigue, the podcasters say, is that often treacherous intersection of adolescence and social media, a big deal for high school age girls like Skylar. Like so many her age, Skylar used her voice on social media as a stream of consciousness, updating friends on what she had for lunch that day, what she's watching on TV, and her emotions in the moment. You can see flickers of her personality. It was really empowering at the time to have a voice. Yeah, a voice. And also highly dangerous. It's one thing to write in a diary about that stuff, but when you start broadcasting those thoughts, it can lead to some trouble. Let's talk about Skylar. How would you describe her? I spoiled her beyond rotten. Skylar was a very bubbly person. She had a smile that liked to room up. She was also very loyal to her friends. She was all those things wrapped into one. She loved the Disney Channel. And every Friday night, they would have a new Disney movie. We'd curl up on the couch to watch a new Disney movie. And she just loved that. <laughs> Dave Neese also told me a story that sticks out for him when Skylar was growing up. She had a tea party for me. And after Mary came home, she noted that Skylar couldn't reach a faucet. And I've been drinking toilet water for the whole tea party. It was a good memory. At the time, it wasn't a good memory. <laughs> At 16, the nieces say Skylar is thriving with a 4.0 grade point average and a part-time job at a fast food restaurant. But in the early afternoon of July 6, 2012, everything changes. 
It's a summer Friday, and Dave Neese goes to the bedroom to wake up his daughter, who he thinks has overslept and has work in a couple of hours. We never bothered Skylar in the morning. She was up all hours of the night talking to her friends on the phone, so we didn't bother her in the mornings. I knocked on her door, and there was no answer. I knocked again, still no answer. So I said, Sky, come on, you gotta get up. And I still didn't get an answer, so I took a coat hanger and opened the door, and uh, I looked down at her bed and it hadn't been slept in. And it scared me. Dave Neese immediately calls his wife, Mary, who was working, to ask if she knew where Skylar could be. And Mary's like, relax. She probably spent the night at a friend's. Don't worry about it. She'll turn up. She has to go to work at four. A few minutes go by, and Dave is still worried. So he calls Mary again. I said, uh, what, what, do I, what do I do? You know, she said, well, first of all, call Sheila. That's the first person you call. Sheila, Eddie, and Skylar Neese met in the second grade at an after-school program near Blacksville, where Sheila grew up. They were about eight years old, and they were fast friends. If they weren't together, they were on the phone together. And that's literally 24 hours a day. So I called Sheila. I said, uh, you got any clue where Skylar is? She said, no. I said, when's the last time you talked to her? She said, last night about midnight. I said, uh, you, haven't, you don't have any clue where she might be or who she might be with? She said, no. Dave's mind is racing. He's trying to piece together the night before in his head, remembering when he last saw her. Skylar came home from work and uh, walked through the door, and she went over and petted her dog and said, hi, Mom, hi, Dad. She walked out and she said, I love you, Daddy. It's the last time I ever heard her. Because by the next day, Skylar hasn't been seen or heard from. And she has work at 4 o'clock. The minute Skylar didn't show up for work, Mary and Dave both knew something was wrong. Wendy's called and said, hey, is Skylar coming to work today? And I said, oh, Jesus. Mary said, call 911. 